each uh, each session is going of our community conversation is going to have a different theme. There is a broader one. What I'm talking about today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what liturgical revision means, as well as what are some specific things that frame our conversation as a wider church today. Um, but as we get into it, we're going to have sessions where we look at um, we're going to look at what our what our values and um, principles are for worship. Anytime we step into the cathedral at Trinity or view online, sort of what is what holds us together, whether we're going to solemn sung or even song or the eight thirty service or the nine a.m. or the eleven fifteen or any other thing. What are some guiding principles that that hold us together? And then we'll have a little bit of time uh, to talk about what are some particular um, gifts and priorities and values of the individual services, especially looking at Sunday morning. And there's a separate small group that meets after the 8.30 class service. Um, so for those who want to just be focused on that, so there'll be some time to talk specifically there. But then we're also going to look at things like um, uh, how we... Um, we're going to take some 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 examples of, uh, of of music and liturgical practice that we think of as really cutting edge, and we're going to look at it for how it actually roots us in a deeper continuity. And at the same time, we're going to take some things that are just you know sort of traditional, um, quote unquote, lots of air quotes here. Um, but as we dig close, look more closely, look at the second or third verse, look at what this is really tell, teaching us. Um, See just how deeply countercultural and disruptive some of our, um, you know, more quote unquote traditional pieces are. Now, all of this is leading in a conversation uh, to talk about what is important to us, what what it means to gather in worship, what it means as Trinity, as Episcopalians, but really just as the people of God. So. I'm that's that's kind of the that's the intro that does Adrian if you're look I can't see you but that does not count against my 10 minutes I hope because it's hard to stick in 10 minutes so today I'm we're going to talk about liturgical revision and this is very much something that is that is going to frame our whole conversation um And it's not going to do a lot of framing. If ah, oh, there it is. Found the page. Good. All right. Good. I went through a number of brief uh, of of titles. Uh, I started with the title "Freedom and Guardrails," uh, but I wasn't totally satisfied with that. So I went with liturgical revision, creativity, improvisation, and continuity. Something that is important to know about Anglicanism. And that, and we are a part of the global Anglican communion. We have always been shaped, or rather at our best, we are shaped as a church not by, by dogmatic formularies, right, things that you must believe in order to belong, but rather by framing guidelines and containers. And those are often shaped uh, not by fiat, but by practice. What we often have is rather than saying this is specifically what we as Episcopalians believe, uh, certainly it's it's more how we worship and what that practice is. But we are more comfortable saying things like within the framework of of the the importance of Holy Scripture, within the framework of baptism and Eucharist, within the framework of the creeds, within the framework of the episcopate, uh, with the Epis historic episcopacy. There is a whole lot of movement and space in order to practice our 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 faith together, uh, and and many of the all the different ways that we worship are within those those framing containers, and that's the same thing that we're doing in any process of major revision or looking inward, which is we tend to identify practices that have been in existence or are in the pro or are in in existence in certain places or nascent are 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 waiting to come forth into the into the into practice so that we can then draw them up into our larger worship life together now we're going to be talking about revision and revision is about expanding language 
Uh, it's about identifying different ways to worship. And I think this is a conversation for the Trinity has been having and wanting to go deeper with for a long time, certainly even before the pandemic. But, you know, even before the current state of the revision conversation, which kind of took a most recent turn in 2018. But revision is about identifying ways to worship uh, that that are that expand what we're doing yeah, are, are, and are consistent with our theology, our ethos, our values, and our identity, and which challenge us to continue to grow. And, and I will continually come back to these. These are, um, for me, what I think are, are essential priorities to worship. Uh, they, they, um, we, Rowan Williams, I actually said it much better. And unfortunately, I don't have the direct quote. This is from a favorite essay from 10, 15 years ago. I have long since lost the essay. So bear with me as I paraphrase Rowan Williams, Archbishop, who I, I should not do. Uh, but he talks about our, um, our, our shared faith, our shared tradition as one that feeds us and inspires us and teaches us but also requires that we mature and grow with it throughout our lives. That really struck me as something that I value about how we worship together um, as Episcopalians. Uh, and it's something for me, these are guiding pr uh, principles. These, these are things that must be in place when we're worshiping together. Um, thing, it, it has to feed us, it has to inspire us and teach us but also it calls us to mature and grow along with it. You can't just sort of fix it and forget it. Uh, we, something is called forth from us as well. So some questions to be asking are, what helps us as people and as individuals to grow through our worship? Is, it, is there a particular style that allows us to do that? Well, I would say there are many styles that allow us to do that. Is it, is it the path of creativity and innovation? Or is it the path of consistency uh, and, and a standard practice that, that goes from day to day or week to week? Well, I played with you a little bit when I said or. It's an and. It's both of those uh, are what holds us together. Now, you all can raise your hand and I can see you in shadow. Raise your hand if you grew up in the Episcopal Church. Oh, I see a few hands. All right, good. Okay, how about this? Raise your hand if you have been in the church for 10 years or more. Okay, so if you've been in for 10 years, you have some sense of, of the, the 1979 Book of Common Prayer as, as the text that guides us. Now at Trinity, we have, um, because we print our bulletins, we have been able to grow into much of the freedom that's already there. Um, and, and we've been often, whether sometimes we've had the books in our hands, sometimes I would say we're more within the tradition um, because if you're going to print things that are not specifically in the prayer book, you have to print it. So you may not have had that in your hands. But the point is this, the 79 prayer book and the prayer book itself, is it's a vessel and a container of our faith. It is what I love about it is that it is it's a manual for prayer and for transformation. It is not, however, as complete as we'd like it to be in terms of how we name God and how we name the people of God, and so it is unfinished. And that is what the difference between a prayer book and a prayer book tradition. Uh, one is something you hold in your hands and it's done until the next edition is printed. But a tradition is one that is always evolving and growing and, and navigating that relationship between continuity and creativity. We also value, and this is part of who we are, uh, and I would say it's even sacramental for us, common prayer. It is no accident, let's see if I can find my ear, right? Book of Common Prayer. Uh, that means we pray together. Now, there are different ways of doing that, and I think we're in a process of opening ourselves up to more and more ways. But the very nature of common prayer means there is an accountability and a fidelity to one another that that is also a core value to who we are. Um, so while I'll pick some names, St. Paul's Cleveland Heights or St. Luke's uh, Cleveland there's a lot of spaces for all three of us to do, do do our services 
with some similarity, but also some difference and, and that are more aligned with particular identities. But simply making up our own services is not something you would see in Episcopal Church. And part of that is because of our commitment to common prayer. So in 2018, we began a process of revision, but not recreation. The 1979 prayer book was a major revision. It was the most significant change in 200 years of the church in America. In many ways, one of the most significant changes uh, throughout the Anglican Communion. And we're not done with it yet, I don't think. Um, but we clearly have a lot of uh, ways we want to grow with it. So the, uh, in 19, 2018... Uh, a commit, uh, the General Convention said we're going to start working towards revision, but we're going to hold on to the 1979 prayer book as our core text. And so these are six points, six or seven, I'm going to have six things that have emerged as, as um, uh, principles that from uh, for this work that come from the Subcommittee for Liturgical Revision and Creation. Uh, some names who are on that. Lauren Winner is on that. Chris Decatur is also on that. He joined as a seminarian, which I think is pretty special. Um, so this, these are some guidelines that will shape our wider church, but also our conversation at Trinity. One, the 1979 book is the foundation and model for common prayer and liturgical development in the church. That means we are still holding on to this thing that was a product of uh, great scholarship uh, with the liturgical movement, with uh, the current scholarship, looking at the culture. Frankly, in the 60s and 70s, we knew as a church we were not going to be the center of the culture for much longer. And the 79 prayer book is an expression of that. So we, we're still growing into that. Two, that book is an authorized text. By the way, Episcopalians pay real close attention to the grammar because it means a lot. All right, so it is an authorized text within a growing set of authorized texts. That has been growing, that set of authorized texts, uh, since 1979. We at Trinity, we often use enriching our worship, and we do that intentionally because it has more language words for God and is intentionally inclusive. Uh, but we will see more and more of those emerge, and we're, we're looking for those to bring into our practice. Okay, number three, arguably the most fun, arguably the most controversial principle is this. The primary platform for the prayer book will be, wait for it, digital and online. Organized according to the shape of the 1979 Book of, book of Common Prayer with printed books remaining an option. Now, first of all, I can't help but notice, but I'm presenting this to you as a digital image of myself, and I'm not currently with you. So if that doesn't make the point, I don't know what does. Um, the prayer book has, I think, in 1979, it was ready to go online because there are so many options within it at, that it, you know, to click and follow through. And now that we have more and more expanded texts, imagine being able to go to... Um, not the, the, our only prayer confession, but rather to three different options and then follow the liturgy through with that. I think that does create a lot of opportunities. I don't, however, want to overstate the value of holding a book. And I know I may sound like a fuddy-duddy or whatever, um, but I have a prayer book, that I, a prayer book hymnal that is marked up. Uh, I've had it for my 16 years of ministry. I hold it, I often hold it in the dean stall, even though I don't reference it at all during the service. Uh, I knew practically when things went off the rail, you know, at previous churches, I could find where I needed to be because I had that book there. But, you know, I, I, this is the book I've held as I've, as I've baptized people, as I've buried people, as I've married folks. Um, I held it Sunday after Sunday, and it's just a wonderful art, artifact. So I think all, all of the above is a part of what's in play. Okay, number, number four, our outcome of this whole process will be a new set of authorized liturgies, quote, set within the Book of Common Prayer tradition, unquote. Uh, five and six, I think, go together in, a, in an important way because it gives the framework as well as the urgency for doing what we're doing. So one, these authorized liturgies will be consistent with the theology of the 1979 prayer book. That means consist consistent with the Trinitarian theology, uh, with the baptismal ecclesiology that was so important 
The 79 book got us away from clericalism and said the ministry is all of us. It's the baptized and the Eucharistic theology. In 79, we pretty much went to being the Eucharist every Sunday, and there was a reason for that, and that will continue to be central. So Trinitarian, baptismal, and Eucharistic theology. Six, it will be consistent with the directives of general convention with respect to liturgical language, inclusive and expansive language, and creation care. What that means, of course, is naming uh, where our language is unnecessarily gendered, uh, which is a reality that, that is becoming more and more clear to a great many of us. Uh, many people knew that all, all along. Uh, so that is a really important priority. Uh, seeking a wider repertoire of words for God and words for the people of God. And generally speaking, all you have to do is look to scripture and look to 2,000 years of Christian history, and you're going to find a lot more words for God than we have practiced. I am at my time, so I'm just going to zoop through pretty quickly. Um, liturgical commissions have been set up in every diocese. We have one here in the diocese led by Rosalind Hughes. Um, it's a season of trial. Uh, trial liturgies, where appropriate, uh, inviting it and listening to what comes in. Um, what changes might be considered? Different structures and prose for the baptismal service. Different ritual actions for the bapt for baptism. Um, gathering. You can have a more streamlined gathering or a more extensive one, enabling congregations to decide what form of gathering best suits you. So in Trinity, that's not hard for us to think about because 839, 11, we already kind of have three different ways of gathering. Many churches kind of just do the same thing, and this opens up the thought. Think about this, though. Imagine a service in a homeless encampment, a weekly service. Maybe that gathering looks a little different than what we do. What about a monthly service in a laundromat? That gathering right, ritual might look different. What about a brand new cathedral that gets built, but it's totally open plan? No pews, no arranged seating. Maybe that gathering looks really different. So naming this is a place for freedom. Um, other responses than a sermon. So we could have a dialogue, a group Lectio Divina. We could have stories from the faithful. We could have a Zoom class after the sermon. I'm not sure that that's exactly what we want, but maybe it is. Um, taking a look at the creed, the, the, the use of the Apostles' Creed might replace the Nicene Creed uh, in certain settings as uh, something appropriate to the Eucharist, or in certain uh, places, other creedal formulations have been suggested. Uh, I know that's also a part of Trinity's recent history, um, I would argue that that can be, must be done with great care and consideration of context. Um, creed is an important place where our relationship of belief is a part of the whole worshiping experience. Uh, it's also where some of our primary teaching happens. Uh, I grew up going to Catholic school, which meant I had all the teaching that I could possibly want and plenty more than I wanted. Uh, but, you know, that's not something that a lot of our children have access to. That's not a, well, something that a lot of our people new to the church have access to. Um, and so that piece of teaching is important. So maybe the question for, for co revision, considering considerations regarding revision is, where can our liturgy, because I think our liturgy is where we do our best teaching, where can our liturgy also be teaching the faith? Um we can consider new texts for confession of sin and absolution. Um, we can consider new texts for Eucharistic prayers. Uh, they would still need to follow certain elements essential to Eucharistic theology, like the institutional narr institu institution narrative and, and epiclesis. Um, other services, other, other ritual actions, other um, celebrations, though, uh, this is a time to be listening for what is in practice or what needs to be in practice so that we can bring that into the conversation. I've gone so far over time, I'm going to close with one, one thought, which is the question is not only what is the wider church looking at, but what is the role of a cathedral and what is the role of Trinity? Well, um, the cathedral is, an insta it, uh, is a lot of things. One thing a cathedral is, is an instrument of continuity, both from our own past to the present and to the future, to our sister churches throughout the diocese, because other churches look to us and, and we are an expression of their ministry, as well as to other denominations, uh, what, what is practiced today, and looking back to the, to the days of the ancients. Tradition 
tradition is not just, you know, what our parents and what our grandparents did. It's what the early church did. But I also wouldn't, um, don't forget how important it is to learn the faith from our grandparents. Um, many of us can say that we learned about the relationship with Jesus through our grandmother or a, a, an uncle. Um, and that's an important thing. And I, I think it's something to be aware of that in the culture, is that still there? If those coming into our, our, our churches might didn't have those relationships, how do we um, teach some of those important pieces of the faith? So the cathedral is an instrument of continuity. It is a place of rich creativity. And oftentimes, and Trinity is one of them, one blessed with the resources to do some creative work as well. Our jo job, I would suggest, is to hold innovation and tradition in creative tension with one another. Our job is to hold innovation and tradition in creative tension with one another. I do not think it helps us to think in terms of we have a creative service and we have a traditional service. Um, I think all services are those things when we're doing it right. Um, and, and in fact, in order to be living, breathing things, uh, those services must be both creative uh, and rooted in a richer continuity. Let's go ahead and move to small groups. I'm in so much trouble because I've gone 10 minutes over. Uh, so we'll fix that for next time.